Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number three in this Bible study series. It's a study of the book of Galatians. We're calling this study, Jesus Sets Us Free. Uh, you will need your Bible open to Galatians chapter two. We're gonna be looking at verses one through 10 of Galatians chapter two today. There is also a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down, click on that link, download that PDF, print it out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, and then there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group or your family to go through afterwards. Before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we, we commit this time to you now as we open your word. Our prayer is that you'll open our hearts and our minds. Uh, our prayer is that you'll help us understand this freedom in Christ that we have as Christ followers. Our, our prayer, as always, Lord, is that you'll change us, uh, that you'll change how we understand who you are, uh, that you'll deepen our understanding of you, that you'll change how we see ourselves and how we see the world around us. In short, Lord, our, our prayer is that you'll transform us, that you'll continue this transformation process uh, as more and more we uh, become the people that you've actually called us to become. We, we love you, Lord. We love your word. We love its place in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're exploring week after week in this Bible study series what freedom in Christ really means. When Jesus said things like in Luke chapter 4, God has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. When, when he said things as in John chapter 8, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What exactly does that mean, freedom in Christ? And specifically, we're asking the same couple of questions each week. First of, first of all, we're asking free from what? Jesus sets us free from what? And then secondly, free to what or free toward what? What are we free to become? Those are the questions that we're asking week after week. Now, when we started this unit two weeks ago, uh, we started with a, a lesson out of Galatians chapter one, just those first 10 verses, which was just Paul's introduction, but he sets the stage for what would become the theme of the entire book when he talked about the false gospel that the Galatian churches had begun to follow, uh, that they had begun to twist and contort the gospel from what he taught them originally. And, and the entire book of Galatians is gonna be about that false gospel. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the second week, last week, we began Paul's origin story. He's come under fire by the very people who were teaching this false gospel. They were also teaching these people in the Galatian churches, you shouldn't be listening to Paul uh, because he's just a people pleaser or he's, uh, he's just twisting the message and that he's getting from the other apostles or, or, or whatever. Uh, and so he begins in the second half of chapter one and all, goes through, all through chapter two, telling his own origin story so that they would remember uh, who he is and how he got this gospel message. He did not get this gospel message from any human um, factors at all. He actually got it directly from Jesus. Uh, and so today's lesson continues his origin story, um, and it continues what essentially was a deconstruction of his faith and a reconstruction uh, in his time spent with Jesus, uh, with the resurrected Jesus. Today's lesson is going to be a, a lesson about Christian cooperation. Even though he operated independently, his message was developed independently of any human intervention. He, he nevertheless very much valued the human cooperation uh, and collaboration that he had with other leaders in the church, and we'll see that in today's lesson. So he's made it a point so far in his origin story that the gospel message he received, he got independent of any human cultural ideology, uh, cultural expressions of faith, independently of any human teaching at all, he got it directly from Jesus, which of course is what qualified him to be able to be referred to as an apostle because only the apostles, I mean, that's one of the qualifications of an apostle is you had to have, have heard this message directly from Jesus. 
uh, that conversion story of Paul is told three times in the book of Acts. The first time you'll find it in, is in Acts chapter 9, and you can go and cross-reference this, this, this origin story with that conversion experience that he expresses in Acts chapter 9. But though he had no human mentor, no supervisor, he did nevertheless value Christian community and Christian cooperation with other leaders, and we're going to see that. That's really what today's lesson is all about. Today's lesson asks us whether our own freedom in Christ that we experience likewise values Christian community and Christian cooperation. It's going to ask us that same question about us. So we're going to be picking up in Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and this is what it sounds like. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. After 14 years, so let's do the math. Last week, in last week's lesson at the end of chapter 1, we saw that there was a three-year period of time after his initial, initial conversion experience. A three-year period of time off in Arabia and in Damascus where he did this, what we refer to as a deconstruction of his Jewish faith and a reconstruction of the gospel of grace, the doctrine of grace. So he was deconstructing what he had learned uh, through the Pharisaic laws and reconstructed in this gospel of grace. And that, that began in that three-year period of time. Uh, so that brings us to a total now of 17 years with very little human influence. That is very little um, uh, introduction to any other apostles' teaching. Um, total of 17 years, 17 years of teaching and preaching this gospel message given him directly by God. 17 years of deconstructing his very Jewish understanding of God's law and reconstructing this theology of grace that is so beautifully set out in this letter and in other letters, largely independent of any other teachers or apostles. Remember we talked last week about Jesus confronting the fact that, that the Pharisees, the teachers of the law among the Jewish people, uh, had pieces of the puzzle. They had all the right pieces of the puzzle. They had studied the scriptures. They had all the right pieces. They just didn't have them all in the right place. And there were specific pieces of the puzzle that Jesus pointed out that didn't seem to fit their picture. And they needed a deconstruction and a reconstruction, which is exactly what this Pharisee named Paul went through. Seventeen years is a long time by anyone's standards, whether looking at it through the lens of their culture or looking at it from our own cultural lens, 17 years is a long time. That is roughly almost half of any of our professional career. And so he's, he's now had 17 years to go through this process. Uh, it is possible that the trip that he's referencing here after these 14 more years, it's possible that this trip to Jerusalem uh, was in connection with the Jerusalem Council, which we read about in Acts 15. It's also possible, some scholars suggest, that this was in connection with the bringing of the uh, love offering from the other churches outside of Jerusalem to Jerusalem. We read about that in Acts chapter 11. We're not absolutely sure which of those trips this is, but it seems to line up pretty well with the Jerusalem Council. So I lean personally, more towards that Jerusalem Council trip. Um, the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 was addressing all of the exact same issues that Paul is addressing in this letter to the Galatians. And so it makes sense to me that he would include this reference uh, in his origin story. And it also makes sense that he took Titus, he has Barnabas with him who was also a Jew, but he took Titus with him who was not Jewish, he was Greek. And he took him, a team member, with him to Jerusalem, kind of as exhibit A in his presentation to the Jerusalem Council as to the fact that Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law are receiving the Spirit in the same way that, 
that, that we saw the Spirit received at Pentecost here among Jewish people. Gentiles are now receiving it in that same way, and here is an example, Titus. I, I show you exhibit A to my, to my presentation. But look at the purpose of this trip. Look at what he says here. To set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Now, I don't believe that this was seeking their approval. He's not saying, here's what I'm teaching. Are, what do you guys think about this? Am I getting this right? I don't think this was seeking mentorship or supervision or approval of any kind. I think rather what he's doing here, he says, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. In other words, I think he's wanting to make sure that we're all on the same page here and that he's not going to encounter obstacles that he's going to have to overcome in the teaching of his gospel because these guys are teaching some other form of this gospel. And so he laid this out for them in order to, to assure all of them we are all teaching the exact same gospel. And he wanted to make sure he wasn't running in vain, so to speak. In, in, in other words, going to have to circle back and and unteach things that these apostles were teaching because he was quite sure of what he was teaching. He got his word directly from the Lord. It was almost a pro, he was almost a prophetic voice in that regard in the sense that he was speaking exactly what Jesus gave him to speak of this gospel. He recognized how important unity in teaching was at this very early stage of this infant church, this infant New Testament church. It's a baby church that's just getting started. And if we don't have unity in our teaching here, then we are in big, big trouble. And that was, that was the tension of the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 as well. Um, having a relationship with the other disciples, he knew, with the other apostles, he knew would be beneficial. He knew that it would be helpful to all of them if they knew each other and they understood what each other were teaching and they understood each other's mission field. All of this was going to be helpful. Uh, if you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. One of the clearest benefits of practicing our Christianity in community with others is the orthodoxy that comes from it. That is, whether and how our gospel message lines up with that which has come before us. That's such an affirmation, and it's so freeing when we feel that, when we understand that, that what I'm teaching, what you're teaching, when we understand that it lines up with what has been taught for thousands of years before us, there's some freedom in that, part of the freedom in Christ that Paul references. All right, then he continues with his story in, chapter, in uh, verse 3. But even Titus, this is the story about Titus, even Titus who was with me was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, that, we, that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. He's telling this part of his origin story to the Galatians in order for them to understand who he is and why they should trust the word that he's given them. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised. In other words, he brought this Greek believer, non-Jewish believer, with him, introduced him to the apostles, and the other apostles did not respond with, oh, well, he's going to have to be circumcised if he's going to be one of us. They did not respond that way. They did not require that of Titus. <clears throat> and Paul is pointing this out to the Galatians, who were being told by these Judaizers, whoever they were from Jerusalem, they were being told, you're going to have to be circumcised if you want to be a follower of Jesus because he was Jewish. You're going to have to stay kosher if you want to be a follower of Jesus because he was Jewish. And so Paul is telling them this is not true. What they're telling you is not true. Even the apostles back in Jerusalem are not teaching this. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, Apparently, some of these Judaizers, who may not have even been real followers of Christ, had sneaked into the meetings under the guise of Christian leadership. Maybe the meeting was the, the Jerusalem Council. That's entirely possible. Uh, again, it's possible that, that all of this was tied in with the Jerusalem Council. I want you to listen out of Acts chapter 15 to 
the in initial description of the Jerusalem Council and see if this doesn't fit well into what Paul is describing here. This is Acts chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem then, they were welcomed by the church, and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Now, doesn't that sound very familiar as to what Paul is describing to the Galatians happened? Verse 5 of, of Acts 15, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, these are those Judaizers, stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question, after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Those little words, after much discussion, are how Dr. Luke, writing the minutes of that Jerusalem Council, described so much of the debate that took place and so much of what these people who had snuck into this meeting pretending to be uh, Christian leaders uh, were, were saying about circumcision and the law of Moses. So back to our passage then, Paul doesn't pull any punches as he describes these people. Look what he says. They slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they may bring us into slavery. That is, slavery to the law of Moses. Now, the whole point of the book of Galatians is to talk about that very idea. To them, he says, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. His motive here is in connecting with the other church leaders, the other, the other apostles, was to preserve the integrity of the gospel message, to make sure all of us are teaching the same simple gospel message in following Jesus. Clearly, there were things that the churches would not have agreed upon, the other things, cultural things that they would not have agreed upon. Listen, the, the, the church in Philippi was very, very different from the Galatian church, which was in turn very different from the church in Antioch or the church in Jerusalem, very different from the church in Rome. They all had their own cult, cultural takes, particularly on matters of church government, on cultural expressions of their faith. They were all very different, just as Christian churches across the world today are all very different from one to the next. But what Paul was interested in is let's make sure, despite those differences, that we are teaching the same simple gospel message. The nature and message of the gospel, they needed to be together on that. There needed to be unity. Christian leaders come together here it is again, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next statement on your listening guide. Christ followers can show great latitude in a variety of cultural expressions of our faith, but we cannot abide any message that adds to or subtracts from the gospel. We talked about this in last week's lesson. It's one thing to make the gospel message culturally relevant to the audience that you're speaking to. It's another thing altogether to change the gospel message or in any way dilute the gospel message in order to make it more appealing to them. That is not an acceptable practice. All right, so the, the apostles there in Jerusalem uh, received Paul. They recognized Paul's ministry. Look at what it says in, in verse 6. And from those who seemed to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles.' 
So what Paul is saying here is, and he's talking about, he mentions Peter, but he's really talking about Peter and John and James, Jesus' brother, James, not John's brother, James. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. I like the way some of the other English translations put this. The NIV says, added nothing to my message. The NLT also says, had nothing to add to what I was preaching. Um, that's the way to read this, I think, is, is what he's saying here is the gospel message that I've been teaching to Gentiles is the same gospel message that they've been teaching to the Jewish people. They didn't, when they heard my gospel message, they tried to add nothing to it. They took nothing away from it. They didn't change it in any way. It's the same gospel message. In other words, Paul's gospel message was identical to theirs. They did not change any of it. And he's wanting the people of Galatia to understand that when presented this message that he presented to them, he presented to the apostles and they loved it and they didn't add anything to it at all. They recognized that Paul had been given a ministry specifically to the Gentiles just as they, Peter and James, uh, had been given a ministry to the Jews. Now that doesn't mean that, that Paul never ministered to Jews, and it doesn't mean that Peter and James never ministered to Gentiles. It just meant that each of them had been given a general mission field to focus on, and they were focusing on that mission field. Now, there's a certain freedom, I think, in that realization, right? There's a certain freedom in realizing that my mission field is not necessarily every culture in the world, uh, that, that, that I'm given an area where I am that God has placed before me, it's just, and he said, tell your story to these people. And by the same token, not every preacher or teacher in the world is given us as a mission field. Uh, and so there's a freedom, there's some freedom in understanding that. Um, if you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next statement together on your listening guide. Part of the freedom we have in Christ is the simple reality that there are mission fields to which we may not be called, just as we are a part of a mission field to which some others may not be called. Can we be okay with that? That's what Paul is expressing here. Uh, this understanding that, that God has tapped him on the shoulder and says, your main mission field, Paul, is going to be to focus on, uh, on non-Jewish belief, non-Jewish people. And, and, and the people in Jerusalem, their main mission field is going to be to focus on Jewish people. That doesn't mean you can't cross over from time to time. That's your main thrust, and there's freedom in understanding that. This agreement then about their mission fields had more to it than just that, though. Listen, listen to what it says beginning in verse 9. When James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to, to the circumcised. Only, and this is verse 10, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. All right, so let's, let's think about what he has said here about Christian community and Christian cooperation among leaders. Let's recap what he has said. First of all, he has said uh, that, that they determined that we were all preaching the same gospel. So we're all good there. The gospel message that we're teaching, however we culturalize it or relevantize it to a particular culture, we're teaching the same message, number one. Number two, they acknowledged that we each had our own mission field in front of us. I to the Gentiles, they to the Jewish people. We were each called to two different mission fields, and that's a good thing. So number three, there was a third thing. They needed to establish one more commonality, and it's an important one, I think. They asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. This would become a central tenet to this movement, this revolution that we refer to as Christianity, caring for and concern for the marginalized and for the poor. No matter how big this revolution becomes, this was, this was vision on their part. It's not all that big so far, but it's obviously growing. And what they're saying is no matter how big this revolution would become, no matter how culturally diverse this revolution becomes, no matter how many different interpretations of scriptures, 
this revolution includes. No matter how many different kinds of governments would eventually be influenced by this revolution, no matter how many personalities get involved, no matter how many mistakes it would otherwise make across the centuries, it would always be a movement that cares about the poor and the marginalized. Why is that? Well, because Jesus cared about the poor and the marginalized, and this is a movement that is based upon Jesus himself, who hold, that holds Jesus at the center of this movement. All these leaders would have this in common, no matter what else, no matter what directions this movement takes, all of these leaders would always have this in common. If they were, in fact, a revolution, and they were, this would become a part of the mantra of this revolution. And Christ followers today, if they are genuinely following Jesus, still have this as their mantra and still have this in common. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last statement together on your listening guide. In a day when we have more Christian denominations and more cultural interpretations of Christianity than we can even count, genuine Christ followers of every flavor still share a common concern for the marginalized and the poor. It is the way of Jesus. So I love that Paul was able to tell as a part of his origin story this commonality uh, that he had not only in how the gospel itself was crafted, the gospel message itself, but actually in this love and concern for the poor and for the marginalized. So what are our takeaways? Let's just recap. Let's summarize what we've said here in looking at these first 10 verses of chapter 2. Number one, one of the benefits of Christian community or Christian cooperation is that we can see how our gospel message lines up with, with that which has come before us. We call that orthodoxy. Number two, no matter the various cultural expressions of Christianity, the gospel message always remains the same. Number three, part of our freedom in Christ is knowing that there are some mission fields to which we are not called. And number four, no matter how diverse Christian cultures may be, they all share this in common, a concern for the marginalized and for the poor. Those are my takeaways, anyway, from this passage. I wonder what yours are. I am loving this unit. I hope that you are loving this Bible study series as well. And we're going to pick up right here where we've left off in chapter 2. We'll pick up next time right, right here. In the meantime, I love you guys. I hope you have an amazing week, and we'll see you right here next time.